Welcome to the eighth lecture in the Henry VII series. In this lecture we will examine the question of how did Henry use royal finance to increase his power? This can be divided into two sub-questions. Firstly, how did Henry use royal finance to secure his position on the throne? Secondly, how did he use it to punish the nobility? This lecture will be split into four parts. We will first examine the ways in which Henry raised ordinary revenue. Then we will move on to examine how he raised extraordinary revenue. After this we will examine the concept of fiscal feudalism and how Henry used this to increase both his wealth and power. Finally, we will examine Henry's expenditure and the different historiographical arguments around the concept of Henry as a money hoarder. Let's first examine the difference between ordinary and extraordinary revenue. The difference is quite simple. Ordinary revenue is the money that comes into the royal treasury on a regular and reliable basis, while extraordinary revenue is raised in addition to this usually in response to an event or urgent need for cash. The most profitable method of ordinary revenue came from the extensive crown lands, while the most common form of extraordinary revenue came from parliamentary subsidies. These were taxes levied at a given point in time, usually due to the threat of war. The largest revenue stream came from crown lands. Under Edward IV, Crown land revenue had been approximately £15,000 per annum. Due to the turbulence of Richard's reign, this had declined to £3,000 per annum by 1485. Henry therefore made the recovery of crown land revenue a financial priority. Due to the act of resumption, Henry was able to enlarge the crown lands to include all the land that Richard had given away to his supporters. Furthermore, Henry passed 138 acts of attainder in the first year as king. Each of these confiscated land from the Yorkist nobility so this income now came to the crown. The revenue came from those tenants who occupied the land who would pay rents. Henry was so successful in raising crown land revenue that by the end of his reign, he had increased revenue to five times the amount that Edward IV had been able to raise. The second most important revenue stream was custom duties. These were essentially taxes that merchants had to pay to import or export goods. England's largest export was wool, constituting 90% of all exports. The right to collect customs duties was known as tonnage and poundage. The king's right to collect this was granted for life in Henry's first parliament of 1485. However, Henry was not as successful at collecting customs duties as he was in raising finance through other means. This is because the cloth trade, and therefore wool exports, was disrupted when he placed a trade embargo on Burgundy in 1493. This improved once the embargo was lifted, but it was still not as good as it could have been. Edward IV had been able to raise around £70,000 in customs revenue during his reign whilst Henry was only able to raise around £40,000. At the end of his reign, he saw that the system needed to improve. In 1507 he commissioned a new book of rates which introduced new rates that were better in line with inflation. After 1509, Henry VIII was able to reap the benefit of this. Let's now examine Henry's collection of extraordinary revenue. Henry VII only relies upon Parliament for a tax subsidy on three occasions and each time, due to the need to muster troops. The first subsidy in 1487 was to raise funds to defend against the Yorkist invasion force led by the Earl of Lincoln, which resulted in a successful military victory at the Battle of Stoke. The second subsidy was so that Henry could raise troops to defend Brittany's independence from France in 1489. As part of the Treaty of Redden, 
The third was to defend the Anglo-Scottish border in 1496, since James IV was threatening an invasion in support of Perkin Warbeck. All three subsidies were passed without objection from Parliament. The tax was levied based upon a system called fifteenths and tenths, this simply meant that rural areas were taxed one-fifteenth of the value of their goods, and urban areas were taxed on one-tenth of the value of their goods. This was an outdated system so did not raise as much as it could have done each subsidy usually amounted to about £30,000. The use of parliamentary tax brought with it social problems in both 1489 and 1496 the tax levy caused a popular rebellion in the rural areas of Yorkshire and Cornwall respectively. This means that, by the second half of his reign, Henry had decided to no longer use parliament subsidies as a way of raising finance. As a result, there were no further subsidies. By the late Elizabethan era, the monarch was forced to rely on parliamentary tax far more often because of the depreciation in the value of crown lands. This would become a long-term cause of the English Civil War. For now, however, Henry could manage the royal finance in a way that meant he did not need to overtax his people. Another example of extraordinary revenue was the French pension. This formed part of the Treaty of Etapla in 1492 and ended England's support for Brittany during the Breton Crisis. The French king, Charles VIII, essentially paid Henry to remove his troops from Brittany. This gave him a generous annual pension of £5,000 that bolstered the treasury and meant that Henry did not need to rely so much on Parliament to grant tax. Fiscal feudalism is a concept to describe the revenue that Henry received from his subjects based upon his position in the feudal system. As King of England, he had rights or prerogatives to demand certain payments from the nobility. This goes back to the establishment of the feudal system under William the Conqueror, who bestowed land on his barons or magnates in return for payments and homage. Traditional historians have argued that Henry exploited his position at the top of the hierarchy to extract feudal dues from the nobility. Revisionist historians would however argue that he simply revived a traditional practice that formed part of his ordinary revenue which had been allowed to lapse during the War of the Roses. Regardless of your interpretation, it is undeniable that Henry used the system of fiscal feudalism to raise revenue and to secure his own position while keeping the nobility in check. Wardships were a long-established feudal due. If a member of the nobility died without an adult heir, the crown had the right to collect the revenue of the estate. In return, it was the king's responsibility to ensure that the ward or underage heir was raised either in the royal court or the household of a trusted noble. For example, Henry bestowed the wardship of the underage third Duke of Buckingham onto his mother, Margaret Beaufort. Until he came of age, the revenue of the Duke's extensive estate would go to the crown, some of which would then go to Beaufort for the accommodation and education of the young Duke. Another example of feudal dues was marriage licenses. It was expected that an heiress or noble widow would seek a license to marry and, given their status, it was important that they received the assent of the king before they married. These licenses, of course, came with a fee. If a noblewoman married without seeking a license, the king had the feudal right to find them. This happened to Catherine Woodville, widow to Jasper Tudor, when she chose to remarry without the king's permission. As a result, she was fined £2,000. In 1487, the revenue from wardships and marriage licenses amounted to only £350 a year. By 1507, 20 years later Henry had increased this amount to £6,000 a year.
Bonds and recognizances were the most notorious of feudal Jews, and they have been used by traditional historians to argue that Henry used finance to punish the nobility. Bonds were contractual agreements between the king and one of his subjects. The subject agreed to pay a fine if they broke the contract, in other words if they showed any sign of disloyalty. A recognizance was slightly different, it was a formal acknowledgement of a pre-existing debt owed to the crown and a promise that this payment would be paid in full. In the late 1490s, Henry and Reginald Bray opened the Council Learned, which was responsible for overseeing the revenue from bonds and recognizances. The fact Henry felt the need to create a separate court for this revenue stream shows their importance. Bonds and recognizances essentially solved two problems, they kept the nobility in check and they raised additional revenue for the crown so Henry did not have to ask Parliament for any more subsidies, and risk another popular rebellion. Henry issued bonds to most leading members of the nobility and some justices of the peace. However, from 1503 onwards, when Edmund Dudley was in charge of the council learned, the number of bonds issued was increased. There was also a rise in the number of fines issued for breaking the bond at the start of Henry VIII's reign. Edmund Dudley confessed that some of these fines were issued illegally, though he did confess this under torture so we can never truly know the extent of his corruption. Let's now examine expenditure, in other words, how much Henry spent and what he chose to spend his money on. There is an ongoing debate amongst historians about the extent to which Henry hoarded his wealth. To hoard wealth is to essentially to build up a large bank of savings. Traditional historians paint a picture of Henry as a man obsessed with personal wealth and filling the royal treasury to the brim. They also consider him to be a miser, someone who refused to spend money unless absolutely necessary. They compare Henry's reign to the opulence and extravagance of his son's reign and therefore make a judgment that Henry was miserly and did not enjoy the splendor of being a king. It is important however to consider that Henry was a late medieval king, not a renaissance king like his son, and he was also in no position to spend money frivolously on anything. That would not further the security and prestige of his dynasty. There is evidence to support the argument that Henry was a miser. By the end of his reign, Henry reportedly had a personal wealth of £113,000, some of this was in cash and some of it was in jewellery and gold plate. This is estimated to be 20 times the wealth of the second wealthiest nobleman which fits with the concept of a late medieval kingship, in that the king was the richest magnet in the land. However, revisionist historians have questioned whether or not this was a true statistic, especially given how easily Henry VIII was able to squander his father's wealth in a war with France that took place during the first five years of his reign. Within the context of late medieval Europe, there is evidence to suggest that Henry did spend extravagantly on art and pageantry that would bolster the Tudor image. For example, he spent extensively on banners and artwork that promoted the Tudor rose. All members of the royal household had to wear emblems, like badges, that showed the personal insignia of the Tudor dynasty, such as the Tudor rose, the Red Welsh dragon and John of Gaunt's greyhound. These images were emblazoned on just about everything in the royal court, ceilings, stained glass windows, stonework, and even chamber pots. In 1503, Henry commissioned the building of his personal chapel in Westminster Abbey and the finished building is covered in Tudor insignia. These visual images were a constant reminder that the Tudors, with their Lancastrian heritage, were the ruling dynasty. There is also contemporary accounts that suggest Henry did spend lavishly on both his personal image and on his royal court especially by the end of his reign. The Venetian ambassador described Henry and his court in the following way, a small hall, hung with handsome tapestry. The king was dressed in a violet-colored gown, lined with cloth of gold, 
By the final decade of his reign, Henry was in a comfortable enough position financially to provide foreign aid to other European leaders. This is an important part of diplomacy and establishing a good relationship with other powers. In 1505, Henry lent Philip of Burgundy £138,000 and between 1505 to 1509, he lent up to £342 to his father Maximilian, the first of the Holy Roman Empire. Maximilian and Philip formed part of the new Habsburg dynasty and they had a strong alliance with Spain due to Philip's marriage to Joanna of Castile. Henry's decision to lend this money forms part of a diplomatic strategy to support Joanna of Castile, sister to Catherine of Aragon, in her bid to become Queen of Spain. However, Henry also had an ulterior motive, since as part of the terms of this loan Maximilian and Philip had to extradite the White Rose, Edmund de la Pole, back to England where he would be imprisoned in the Tower of London. This ultimately shows that Henry prioritized domestic security and the establishment of an alliance with the rising Habsburg dynasty. This was more important to Henry in his final years than having financial reserves. Therefore it is fair to say that Henry therefore spent money when required to bolster the Tudor image. This was in line with the ideals of medieval kingship, his power lay in his wealth since a king needed a good reserve of finance in order to summon an army if at any moment he needed to defend his position on the throne. Given the fifty years of civil war and his status as a usurper, Henry never forgot this fact. He spent money wisely, when necessary, to promote his image and to secure both his own position on the throne and the smooth succession of his son Henry VIII. Let's now return to our overarching question of how did Henry VII use royal finance to increase his power? Firstly, Henry increased the amount he received from ordinary revenue, most notably he increased profit from crown lands following the act of resumption. Secondly Henry used Parliament when necessary in the first half of his reign to raise subsidies or tax, but by the second half of his reign he was looking to better alternatives of raising additional revenue. This led him to increasingly use his position at the top of the feudal system to force his wealthiest subjects to pay him money in the form of feudal dues, bonds and recognizances. The number of fines issued for failing to agree to the terms of a bond significantly increased after 1503 when Edmund Dudley took charge of the council learned. Finally, Henry knew how to spend money when necessary in order to promote his own image and to establish the Tudor dynasty. We should therefore move beyond the old myth that Henry was a money hoarder who was frugal with his expenditure.